So tonight we're going to be doing a very special topic. We're taking a break from the regular Tehillim, come back to the Zat Hashem after the holidays. This topic that we're going to do tonight, I really intended to do a long time ago. I just pushed it off, but recently as a result of the political climate in this country and in Israel, the elections there, I decided that it was important that we discuss that right away. This uh, is a very, very significant topic and it's about unity. And I decided to call it, United We Stand, Divided We Fall. A famous uh, motto that was used in the past to bring out the importance of unity. How unity brings strength to everyone. And divisiveness makes everyone weaker. And as a result of divisiveness, disputes, people fail, marriages fall apart, and friendships, what were, what was once upon a time a good friendship, may dissolve. So, let's begin with asking, what's the most important problem today? What do you think is the most serious problem that people are complaining about or people feel threatened by? I guess some would say nuclear war, there's always a potential for that. Others may say global warming, they've heard a lot about that in the news. The economy is something that everyone talks about. Others perhaps will point to all kinds of health matters, cancer, many people are dying from cancer these days, or heart disease, which is also a big problem. There's no doubt that all of these are issues, let's call them issues. But you will be surprised with what the real problem, the way at least the way I see it is. In order to understand a little bit of what is going on today and where the problem lies, compare this generation to the past. And you will notice, if you recall, in your days for sure, how we looked up to our teachers a lot more than these days. We looked up to our leaders. Children admired their parents. Some still do. But in the past, it was much more prominent. It was a, something that was self-evident. Divorce in the past was not as common either. So I think everyone is in agreement that there has been many, many, many changes that have occurred over the past few generations all over the world. What has happened? In a nutshell, human beings have lost respect for each other. I consider that perhaps one of the, the biggest problems that we are facing today. There are possibly others, lack of respect for other human beings. It's not surprising, therefore, that friendships, true friendships, are very rare. In the past, it was more common. I think you, in your days, people would knock on the door of your parents without being invited. They didn't have to call, they just came over and had a coffee or a tea, in your case. Right. It was no big deal. Today, people don't have time for you. So friendship is something that exists in the dictionary, perhaps, but not in reality. Even though some will claim, he's my friend. I'm talking about true friendship where people give of their time and go out of their way to help another human being. They're in touch, they care about each other, they show their concern about them. And it's not just about coming and celebrating a birthday together or coming to the wedding, perhaps. People like weddings because they like to eat. <laughs> they're not necessarily happy for you. You think they're happy for you? They're happy they're getting a good meal. Yes. I've noticed that. That's what immediately happens when the food is served. Everybody just forgets about everything and they rush to the food. <laughs> so, life today is driven by self-interests, personal interests. And as a result of it being driven by personal interests, this is taking a toll. It's taking a toll on friendships, it's taking a toll on marriage, and believe it or not, it's taking a toll on government leadership personal interests. 
In other words, it's not about a cause, an important cause that everyone wants to help out and do something about it, work together. No, it's about personal interests. What really pained me in the last few days, which got me going a little bit more, is what an Israeli politician said as a result of the most recent elections. This is a politician who lost, a politician who was dreaming that he was going to win. And he, it finally dawned on him the morning after that he will be in the opposition. So you know what he said? I'm going to make the other side miserable. miserable yeah. I'm going to make their life miserable. Wow, I was completely shocked. Is that all you have to say? Why not just concede that you've lost, accept the fact that the majority prefers something different than what you would like, right. and if you wish, you can definitely offer an alternative during your time in the government. You can definitely suggest an alternative, but to make someone's life miserable for what? Only you know better, they don't. What's wrong? What's going on here? So we must realize that disputes always existed. There were always disputes throughout her history. Differences of opinion, different philosophies, and different priorities. But what, it, what really hurts? What is the most painful of all disputes? I think the most painful, I think you would agree, is when children Members of the same family argue about inheritance, for example. And unfortunately, we all know cases like that. Kids, family members who used to be united, who were very close to each other, would attend each other's semachot, the weddings, bar mitzvah, and so forth. They stopped going. Brothers and sisters who haven't spoken to each other for over 25 years because of money. It's usually because of money. What happened? Money is, is an idol, yes. And that has unfortunately broken up families that once upon a time were very united, very together. So it hurts a lot more when it's the family that is fighting. In order to understand this a little bit better, how painful this may be, I prefer to use the example of soccer. In soccer, do you know what the most painful goal is? You know, if you make a goal, it's uh, significant. The more goals, the better. But what's the most painful goal for the team which the goal entered in their net? You An auto goal. When you put the ball into your own net, you caused a, an auto goal. You know how painful that is? How embarrassing it is? Not that the enemy or that the other team did it, you did it to yourself. And that is exactly what happens when family members, people of the, uh, who are supposed to be close to each other, fight. They're causing themselves an out of goal. Who was the first one to talk about this? Yeshayahu, Isaiah the prophet. When he said, yeah. that your biggest troublemakers, the ones who will fight you, destroy you, will be those that will come from your midst, from amongst you. That's an incredible prophecy. But why should it happen? You know, we can understand from the outside, there are all types of enemies. But from the inside, what's driving them? And the answer is simple, power, jealousy. Ego. Ego, honor, all of these things that we're familiar with. It's not a cause that they're fighting for necessarily. They wouldn't destroy you because of that. In order to go out and to destroy a brother or a friend, someone from the same family, it can only be because what's driving them is self-interest, power, ego, kavod, honor, jealousy. And that hasn't changed. It's always been like that. And that, unfortunately, has been very, very destructive throughout our history. Not just in Israel, not only for the Jewish people, but all over the world. 
All right, now add to this, add to these troubles, the differences that exist as a result of cultural gap, right? People are different. There's men and women who are different. There's age differences. There's a difference in religion. There's a difference in language. You see how all of this adds up to, to create differences between people. So these differences is what causes people to become distant from each other, unless they're intelligent enough to bridge those gaps. It is possible. I've seen many marriages where people are from completely different backgrounds, speaking completely different languages. Somehow they figured it out. I think they used sign language <laughs> in the beginning. But anyway, they have a lovely life because they respect each other. They have a common goal. They cooperate. So it is possible, but I just presented some of the ideas here that bring distance between people. That people unfortunately don't realize that these are silly things that they can be overcome. Power, of course, the, the desire for power is not so silly. It's something very, very difficult to overcome. It is something that is in our nature, at least in the nature of some people who are crazy about it. But some of the other differences are really minor, but you'd be surprised. Even these minor differences cause problems. For example, men and women. Even though I shouldn't say that it's minor, it's totally not minor, not at all. But it's something that with proper guidance, a young couple can figure things out. What is important for the woman, what's important for the man, and in this way avoid many misunderstandings. So a lot of times when it's men and women having differences, it's really misunderstandings. It's a result of the ignorance of the two, not being informed as to what are the priorities of each one. And they're, by the way, they're both right. They can be both right. Just each one seeing things from a different perspective. What's funny, when we talk about cultural gaps, is that you would be surprised on how even gestures are different between different countries. Let me give you a quick example. If I pulled my ear here, if I did this, what would you think? What would that mean to you? Well, it could mean nothing, if you're not familiar with it. It could be insulting, depending from which country you are. Or, if you were from Brazil, from Portugal, then you would know that that means this is very tasty. It's a gesture. In this country, I think they do with the thumbs up. You've seen that. Yeah. Don't try that in the Middle East in certain countries, I think in Bangladesh actually, you do this, it may not be something very, very pleasant in some countries, even though in others it's acceptable to, to mean okay. Not everywhere. There's all kinds of gestures, and they're actually very funny how people misinterpret them because they're not familiar with that particular culture. It's important, therefore, when you're learning a foreign language, to learn the gestures as well. You know, in Italy, they use their hands a lot. And in Japan, you don't want to use your hands a lot. It's not respectful. Differences. You know. And of course, I learn these things because I'm interested in it. Not only in the language, but in the culture of the country. So it helps one to become familiar with someone who's different than you. United States history is fascinating. It really, really is from the very beginning, how it evolved, politics, and you have no idea how many parties there have been here. Political parties, we're talking about differences, right? If you tell someone, I belong to the Federalist Party, he says, what's that? There was once upon a time a Federalist Party, and there was once upon a time a Republican Democratic Party, both Republican Democratic. And there was a Whig party. You know that there is even a communist party. <laughs> Liberal parties, all kinds of parties, many, many small parties. Today, these parties are not really heard of because they won't make it. 
So you basically have Republicans and Democrats, even though not all Republicans are the same and not all Democrats are the same. You have more liberal, you have more conservative. But what you have is, here is so many differences of opinion. And what's the big deal? The big deal is that it has become partisanship. It's no longer a different philosophy or a different opinion. It's something that George Washington wrote in his farewell letter when he was retiring, that he was afraid of that, that it was, he would become very political, party-driven, which is exactly what the problem is today. It's, it pretty much started right after his death. It went out of control. And that, of course, leads to tremendous divisiveness, what we call politics. Instead of focusing on what's best for the country, what this country needs, and working together to find the best solution by seeking expert help, really working hard, instead, your self-interests, personal interests, that's what's driving all of this. So what, what should there be? What would make it a success, a common cause? Right? Everybody working for a common cause. So the question is, what's a common cause? So I'm going to give you an example from our sources, from Pirkevot. In the past, we had two very famous schools of thought, Bet Hillel and Bet Shammai. You may recall, rabbis had many discussions amongst themselves, and sometimes they differed in their opinion about all kinds of areas in Halakha and Judaic law. But these are the more famous ones because we're talking about schools, the school of Bet Hillel and Bet Shammai, different perspective about certain things, and they had many differences of opinion. And for the most part, we follow Bet Hillel. True. But the rabbis tell us something very interesting. If you're going to have a machloket, if you're going to have a dispute with someone, make sure that it's L'Shem Shamayim, for the sake of heaven like the machloket, like the disputes of Bet Hillel and Bet Shammai. Even though they had differences of opinion about very important areas of Judaic law, nonetheless, they were driven by L'Shem Shammai for the sake of heaven. What does that mean? So the Mishnah continues on to say that something that is L'Shem Shammai, <laughs> Sofa Lit Kayem, a machloket, a dispute that is for the sake of heaven, it will endure. It will be productive. Something good will come out of it. So what does this tell you? That if it's not l'shem shamayim, not for the sake of heaven, it will not endure. On the contrary, it will be very damaging. It will tear people apart. It could tear the nation apart. So make sure that what is driving you to have a different opinion is l'shem shamayim, for the sake of heaven. You're after the truth. The commentaries tell us, look at the word Shamaim. Shamaim, the atmosphere, when Hashem created, it was made of the two elements, water and fire. Two opposing elements, water and fire. Nonetheless, they united, the two elements united to obey the Almighty. So in creation, you have two opposing elements uniting to obey the Almighty. So therefore, what is important when there is a dispute is not what, what is being disputed, it is how and why. You have to always check the inner motivation of what's driving the two sides to argue. So what happened with Beth Hillel and Beth Shammai? <laughs> what happened with these two very different opinions? No one really wins. The two opinions eventually merge into the stream of Jewish tradition. Whereas if you have an, a real enemy who's not interested in a certain cause, he's an enemy of yours, what does he want? He wants to win. Here, it wasn't about winning. It was for the sake of heaven. We're after the truth. So therefore, their opinions eventually merged and formed the halacha that we have today. Speaking about enemies, David Amelech, David the king, tells us in Tehilim, Ani shalom adaber I'm after peace. I'm a man of peace. I don't want to wage battle. I don't want to go to war. But when I seek peace, the enemy, that's all they want, is war. 
Why? Because the enemy wants to win. And because they want to win, the end justifies the means. You've heard of that. The end justifies the means. Sometimes people are prepared to do anything it takes because they want to win. It could be a husband who wants to win or the wife. And they can end up spending millions of dollars in the court because they have to win. What about sharing? What about <laughs> just in having a, a cordial, amicable relationship? Very difficult. Unfortunately, a lot of couples, by the time they come to court, they've fought so much that it's very, very difficult to bring them down, calm them down, and hopefully find a solution that is agreeable to the two. So all they're thinking is about war. So what, hands, what ends up in that war? They both lose. Instead of both winning, they both lose. Mm -hmm. Oh, I forgot. There is someone that wins, the lawyers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they get all the money. Yeah. And that is what the other pasuk says. En shalom amar Hashem reshaim. The reshaim, the wicked, are not really interested in shalom and peace. In order for there to be peace, there needs to be some compromise. People have to show that they're sincere. If you are out to win at all costs, then you're not interested in peace. So that is obvious from history, that there have been many, many nations, groups, who were not motivated really for peace, just to win, to take over, to subjugate the other country, and to rule the land by their laws. Okay, we all know the ills of divisiveness. Now let's talk a little bit about the pluses, the advantages of unity. We know that with unity, a lot can be accomplished. There was a father. This is brought down in our sources, but I think it's also in Greek sources as well. Famous uh, Meshal parable. A father who was getting older, and right before his death, he decided to call on his children. And he prepared a bundle of sticks, a big bundle of, of sticks, and he asked the older son to break it. Break it. He couldn't. He asked every one of his children to try to break it. None of them could. Now he undid the bundle, and each stick was by itself. And he asked the brothers now to break the sticks. No problem. They were able to break the sticks. You see the father turn to his children, this is the lesson that I wanted to teach you. So long as you are together as a bundle, no one will be able to break you. If you are united, that will bring you tremendous strength. But the moment that you separate, the moment that you are divided, you will fall. The enemy will be able to defeat you. You will be a lot weaker than when you are together. And this reminded me of what Winston Churchill says. He said something very similar. When there is no enemy within, the enemy outside cannot hurt you. Enemy within? Remember we just talked about that? When people are each other's enemy, as they say in English, I think, with such friends, who needs enemies? <laughs> you know, but sometimes when the relationship is so bad amongst people who are supposed to be close, it's, it's very, very painful. But it's not just the pain. It weakens everyone. They don't realize what they're missing. They can be very, very strong. If they would be united, they would be together. Rabbis tell us that if we would not have received the Torah, there's so much that we can learn from nature. And this is really fascinating. If you're into nature, zoology, animals, birds, there's a lot that one can learn from them. Rabbis tell us if we did not have the Torah, we could learn certain valuable lessons from the animal kingdom, from the birds. Even in Mishlei, there's several pesukim about the strength of certain animals. For example, Shlomo Melech points to the Arbe, locust. He says, take a look at the locust. Melech en la Arbe ve'atza chotzetz kulo. The locust has no king, but they all go together as a troop. There's a lot that you can learn from the ant, how it is not lazy. But my favorite is the loyalty. The loyalty that certain birds, certain animals show for each other. 
there are some that mate for life. That's it, one. After one dies, they don't remarry. Faithfulness, loyalty, that we will be able to learn from certain animals. Do you know that, uh, I think, with certain penguins and with other animals, <coughs> it's not only the mother taking care of the cheeks. The father is involved, too. They work together. It's incredible. And then there is the wolf pack. Interesting. You don't see that with all the animals, but the wolves, they work as a pack. And as a result of working together as a pack, they're able to bring down a big animal. One wolf by himself may not succeed to bring down a big moose. May not be able to do it on his own. But if it's a pack of wolves, yes, a pack of wolves can accomplish a lot. It's the number game. And the more you have, the stronger you are. We've seen the importance of unity in many areas of life. Language unites. I've seen this many, many times. When I address somebody in his native tongue, all of a sudden all the ice melts. All the barriers are gone. We become friends. That's how it's worked, I mean, for me, many, many times, and it's a fact. I think everybody can agree with that. The language can be a barrier, or it can unify people, speaking the same language. Especially if we're talking about that the two people are somewhere else, not in their native country, and they meet each other, somehow they can relate to each other, talk about the same things, the same foods, the same jokes, so language can unite, or it can be a barrier. Religion also unites. And I've even noticed that profession unites. You know, at certain weddings, banquets, there is what they call sitting arrangement. You sit at a certain table where they place your, your name. And those that are responsible for this will try to put people who are close to each other, either their friends, family, or same profession. A heart surgeon doesn't want to sit next to a plumber. <laughs> he wants to sit next to other doctors. At least they have what to talk about. It makes some sense. So I use this as an example just to point out, you see, there are certain things that bring people together. There's something that they have in common. Marriage, the Torah intended for it to serve as a medium through which you can unite a man and a woman who are so different by getting married and committing to each other that they're going to hopefully work together in raising a family, in building a home, they will succeed. I always remind people, don't forget you have a third partner upstairs, God. He also wants to be involved as long as you let him into the house. Some people kick God out of the house. Yes. They don't want to have anything to do with him, so that's different. But if you let the Divine Presence into the house, you have a better chance that that house will be blessed. So marriage is holy. Marriage is intended, intended to be a way where a man and woman can build something together, even though they're so different. It's not just about keeping company, keeping each other company, or sharing the, the same roof over your head. It's about raising a family. It's a great responsibility. It's something that people should be happy about if they found each other initially. But wait a minute. If that's what it was intended to be, and it does work some of the time, why doesn't it work all the time? What gets in the way? What we just mentioned that helps to bring about unity, language, profession, religion, apparently is not enough. What's missing? Or what's getting in the way What's interfering with the unity over here? The answer is selfishness. Remember, we started off saying that the biggest problem is a lack of respect. But we haven't really talked about why there is a lack of respect. It really begins with selfishness. And today that selfishness is very, very developed, much more than in the past. And when people are very, very selfish, egocentric, and they're more into themselves, they don't see someone else, even though they're right in front of them. It's like they don't see them. They don't exist for them. 
Selfishness. Selfishness is the one that gets in the way where the potential for being together, being united, exists, but because of personal interest, which is the same thing like selfishness, it gets in the way. All right, so we've come to the point where we need to address this selfishness. How do you control selfishness? Obviously, we don't have the time to go through all the information that the rabbis share with us about this particular problem, but I'm going to, I think, what we can do is quote one very important quote from the Tanya, which, by the way, uh, we uploaded the whole series on that. The Tanya, which is a book that delves more into the Kabbalah, in the Hasidut, Jewish mysticism, points out something very important in chapter 32. So I'm going to quote to you in the English. Those that give priority to their physical selves and make their soul subordinate, in other words, the soul is not as important, cannot achieve sincere brotherhood. In other words, if people put more emphasis and give more importance to their physical selves, to the food, to their comfort, and all of that, and their soul, their spiritual life, is subordinate, they can never achieve sincere brotherhood. They can never be real friends. The greater the degree of spirituality, therefore, in a person's life, the more spirituality he achieves, the more perfect can his love be for another human being. So what does it all depend on? How spiritual an individual is. The more physical he is, the more he cares about his comfort and his food, the more difficult he will have connecting with other human beings. Not just the spouse, but other human beings, even children. You think he will be patient with his children? So it's all about physicality versus spirituality. What's more important? What's the one that's the most dominant in this person's life? Unfortunately, today, more than ever, what's more dominant is the physical self. People are just immersed in materialism. I have a whole lecture about that, what materialism has done, how destructive it is to this generation. So this has side effects, which, of course, at the end of the day, it's lack of respect for other people. He's so into himself that he doesn't see anyone else. Let me show you a very, very incredible story that happened in Australia years ago that proves this point, how spirituality can really change not only the human being, but a marriage for the better. There was a young couple who was not getting along. They were having a very, very hard time, and the woman just gave up because, according to her, the man was very, very abusive, verbal abusive. And uh, the husband felt differently. He felt that this marriage still had potential, and he was always trying to seek help to bring about shalom bayit, peace and harmony in the home. But it didn't help. No matter what this husband did, no matter what the rabbi who he asked for her, his help tried, the woman said, no, it's not going to work. So the day came when they were going to meet in court. In the meantime, before that court date, this husband was eating by the rabbi's home. And the rabbi convinced him, you know, be a little bit more religious, a little bit more spiritual. Take upon yourself, commit yourself to one mitzvah. I suggest tefillin, put on tefillin every day except for Shabbat. So over time, he succeeded in convincing the husband to put on tefillin. Anyway, so when that day of court came, the man, the husband, did not have enough time to go back home and drop off his tefillin. He came with his tefillin to the court. Mm -hmm. His wife saw this, and she was concerned. Rabbi, why did you give him an amulet of protection? That's what she called it, even she didn't know what it was. You gave me, this is an amulet so that he should succeed in court, right? I want one too. You have to be fair. Give me one too. So the rabbi tells the woman, no, no, no. It's not an amulet of protection the way you, you think it is. This is what happened, that your husband over the past few months has really turned around. He's changed his lifestyle. He's become more observant. He's a more spiritual person than he was ever before. He is 
committed to put on tefillin every day. She says, really? My husband has become more spiritual? He actually made a commitment every day to put on tefillin? I admire that. If my husband can make that kind of a change in his lifestyle to become a more spiritual individual, I think we have a chance that our marriage can also improve as a result. They got back together and they've been very happy ever since. Not only happy, but they've grown together, become very observant and very dedicated to Torah and Mitzvot. Spirituality, that is what was introduced into the home. Not only did the husband change as a, as a human being, but the whole marriage, the whole relationship benefited from it. Unity is so special that the rabbis tell us that if God would only see that the Jewish people are united, he would not allow the accusing angel to cause us any harm, to accuse, to accuse us of anything. Even if the Jewish people would be worshipping idols, the Midrash says, but they're united, the Almighty would not allow the accusing angel to get involved. That always fascinated me. Why is unity so powerful that Hashem says, you know what, accusing angel, go away. I'm going to overlook their sins, even the more serious sins, just because they're united? What is there in unity that would protect them from the accusing angel? I think the verse in Mishlei says it all. There's a beautiful verse that says, Sina teored medanim. Sina, hatred, begets, produces, medanim, fights. People who hate each other, who don't like each other, there's no chemistry between them, they can get into a lot of fights. Sina, if it's present, medanim, it easily ignites, awakes many, many fights and disputes. But in all peshaim and all faults, love covers up. What does that mean that love covers up all faults? It means, you may have heard of another saying, a true friend is one who knows you with all your faults and still loves you. We all have faults. We all have weaknesses. So a true friend is one who knows you with all your faults and still accepts you. He still loves you, still cares about you. He's forgiving. So that is what Hashem is saying, pretty much. There's love between you. And this love is so powerful. You're united, you're together. I will, I am prepared to overlook all your faults. It doesn't mean that the faults are forgotten. It doesn't mean that everything is forgiven and erased. But Hashem says, I will overlook them for now. You are together, you are united, and I love that. Hashem loves shalom. He loves peace between people. And therefore, He's willing to overlook the faults. So what do we learn from all of this? That it's important to be more accepting of others. To learn more about the differences, perhaps, that exist between us. And when it comes to marriage, I always recommend guidance. Before a man and woman get married, it's very important that they should invest in guidance. Learning about what life is, what they should be expecting, what they should be anticipating. The children are going to come in, and that's going to change things a little bit. What to expect, how to deal with some issues as they come. It's impossible to teach everything, because there's all kinds of possibilities in life. But at least to lay the groundwork and to give the young couple a fair chance, a fair chance to deal with issues. Now, even though they may not know the answer to a particular problem, they may not have the solution yet, at least they will know that when there is a problem, they should consult with someone. That in itself is an important idea. When you don't know the answer to a question, then ask. Don't live your life with doubts, with questions. People are miserable. People are depressed and sad because they have all these things that are troubling them. Really. Ask. As the verse says, If you have some worry, something that you're anxious about, talk it over with others. 
that's what psychologists do. They may not have a solution for you, but they're good listeners. And that helps. That helps sometimes. That's all it takes. They have a place or a person to whom they can vent their problems. But obviously the preferred situation is someone who can really help you, guide you, and show you how to improve the situation. A lot of marriages could have been saved if the couple would have had the proper guidance, or at the very least, the two would have met with someone who really cares about them, who would really want to help them. But the two, of course, have to agree to this. We've spoken about all the terrible damage that divisiveness causes, machloket, dissension. What is some advice? What are some easy tips that can help us deal with it? Whether this is a government, whether this is a family, whether this is a partnership, some advice that can help everyone, I think, is, is important. There's quite a bit out there. Uh, I'm sure some very good books that have been written about this. We definitely have valuable sources that help in dealing with such issues. People really have to be willing to study, <coughs> to take the time if they're interested in achieving peace. They really want to have a peaceful relationship with others, it's an important investment. Take the time to study and to find out what it is that you can do to better the situation. But here are some tips. Number one, and I think this is the most important one of all, I think, at least as a, as a start, show respect for another human being. We've been talking about this. It's all about the lack of respect today for other people. Or who may be nice people, they're just different than you. Show respect for another human being. Rabbis point this out in more than one way. They point to the mitzvah that we have in the Torah. Bifnei mm sevata kum, right? Ba'adarta pnei zaken. Get up for those who are older than you. That's the mitzvah in the Torah. Show respect for the seniors. Even though it's not your father or grandfather, so what? He's an elderly gentleman. He deserves to be respected. Sometimes people don't know this. They don't stand up during the bus, and this elderly gentleman needs to sit down. It's common sense. The Torah says no. It's not a, don't think of it just as common sense. This is a mitzvah. This is very important for you to adapt in your life. Be respectful of others. Listen to somebody else's point of view. People have a problem with this too. They're not good listeners. Train yourself to be a good listener. Listen to what others have to say. You may be surprised. Maybe you'll learn something you didn't know before. People don't listen. They think they're right. They think they know it all. They don't give the other person a chance to express himself. We have to train ourselves to be better listeners. So remember, this is also true in a husband-wife relationship. Important to listen to the other individual. Educate yourself about other cultures. I think this is also very important, and that's why I included it here. A lot of times it's simply ignorance. People are totally ignorant of the real facts, and as a result of their ignorance, they hate someone, they think somebody did something. It's totally, completely far-fetched, totally not true. And sometimes people are just influence because it's the masses. The masses are driven by some influential charismatic leader who may be a bigot, who hates others who are different than him. For whatever reason, it makes no difference. And the masses go along with him without knowing. Ignorant. So this has been a problem throughout history. Everywhere. The Jews have suffered a lot because of this. The ignorance of many, many people out there who persecuted them for no real reason, not knowing the true facts. Have an open mind. You may be wrong. People are not always respectful of others because they think that they're right. Okay, maybe you're right, but maybe you're wrong. Are you sure you're right? And even if you're right, why not be respectful of another opinion? Convince the other individual, if you can, that he's wrong. So in, in order for a person to have a healthy attitude towards differing opinions, have an open mind. 
if people would have an open mind, they would be able to learn a lot more than if their mind is already made up. And I've heard a lot of people pretty much say this, I've already made up my mind, don't confuse me with the facts. I made up my mind. Hmm. Well, there's no use arguing with such people, obviously. It's a waste of time. But isn't it silly for people to say that? They don't want to have an open mind. Why not? That's a topic for another time. Why don't people want to have an open mind? They're comfortable with the way they think, their lifestyle. They don't want to make any changes. They're afraid of those changes for whatever reason. So having an open mind is crucial to being accepting of others. Now comes one of the favorites for this generation especially. Don't let the media educate you. You want to be educated, right? Then don't let the media educate you because they may not be telling you the truth. It's fake. It's not real. The media, unfortunately, is motivated for some self-interest. Unfortunately, they're not being always honest with the facts. The facts may be true, but the tone is not real, it's not good, it's not healthy. So if the tone is no good, then it comes across negative, perhaps. So don't let the media educate you. Find some good sources, look around, speak to people, and educate yourself. Develop sensitivity for the weak. Also a very important point that can be very, very helpful in life towards a better relationship with other people, especially those that are different than us. Sensitivity. Some people are poor. Some people are not as intelligent. Some people are physically not fit. Regardless, people are very, very different and people are frail. And you never know what's going on in another person's life. This is a very, very challenging situation. That is why I'm including it here, because this also pertains to the act of giving charity. A lot of us are really swamped, swamped by people coming from all over the world seeking help. And in some ways, I see this as a positive development because Hashem wants the Jewish people to be kind-hearted to each other before Mashiach comes so that we should eliminate that baseless hatred that existed and replace it with brotherly love, Ahavat Chinam, baseless love. This is something that we need to do to rectify our sins of the past. So what did God do in order to enable this? He created Boeing <laughs> and all these companies that make big planes that cross the ocean from Israel in 15 hours. Do you know what it was to collect money 200 years ago? Boats. To go by boat in the seas? Weeks and if not months and the dangers? Today it's possible. So people who need help, whether it is because they need a kidney transplant, whether it is to marry off a child, or because they owe so much money, or because their home was taken away from them, or they simply do not make ends meet because they're out of a job. It's a big mitzvah to help them. But it's challenging because it's one after another, one after another. I get sometimes eight in one morning. Eight. Now, they all know when to come, which hours to come, because I pretty much tell them only at this time, because I'm busy throughout the rest of the day, and most of them come at that time. So, a lot of them. What do you do? It's challenging. Obviously, you have to figure out how much you can afford. Figure you're going to have three, four hundred, five hundred a year, and you're going to give each one according to their need, depending, of course, on their ability to raise funds elsewhere or not. A lot of things have to be considered, but it's a big mitzvah, but it's also a challenge. But what's the challenge here? It's not so much the money. For some people it is the money because they're stingy. You know what the biggest challenge is? Is to smile while you're giving them the money. Mm. The rabbis therefore train us. You be the first one to greet a person in the street. Don't wait for the person to say, hi, how are you doing? You know, some people are very nice. They greet you. They don't know you. They greet you. That's very, very nice. Gentlemen, rabbis tell us, you be the first one. Train yourself to be the first one to greet people and smile. Why, Why smile? <laughs> it's not so much only for the other individual who you 
maybe helping him by smiling to him. It's also for yourself. Don't you want to be happy? Smile. There's a lot of things that will make us upset, sad. Smile. Get used to smiling. And when you smile to someone who's in pain, who needs your help, you've helped him a lot more with your smile than with the money you gave him. You receive more blessings for the smile and for the good words that you said to him than the money. How much money did you give him? You didn't give him $10,000. He needs right now 35000 for whatever reason. Kidney. Kidneys can be expensive. Right? How much are you going to give him? $50? That's very nice of you. But God willing, he'll, he'll collect all that money. But take the time, hear his story, sit down with him, offer him a glass of water. That's more valuable than the money that he gave him. So this is a challenge. People don't realize that we are being constantly challenged. So we've got to train ourselves not only to be patient, to appreciate the opportunity that Hashem gave us to do a mitzvah. But how are you going to do the mitzvah if you don't respect another human being? <laughs> you see what I mean? A lot of people have a hard time because they, in their nature, in their character, there are many flaws. They have the money, but they're stingy, or they're temperamental, or they don't have patience, or they don't think that that guy deserves a penny. Let him work hard, hard for his money, just the way I did. Sir, do you know what's going on in his house? Do you know that he has eight children at home? A wife that doesn't work, who's maybe not feeling well, and he was out of work for several months now. Put yourself in his shoes for a moment. People don't do that. They don't put themselves in the shoe of somebody else. That is why there was a big rabbi who used to collect firewood in the winter for the widows in Europe who had no firewood. There was no central heat like we have. And he approached this wealthy man in a very cold winter night and he knocked on the door. I need to speak to you. Yes, Rabbi, please come in. The house is warm. No, 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 I need to speak to you outside. But it's cold. I need to speak to you outside. So he tells him outside in the cold winter night that he needs so much money to collect firewood. Rabbi, I'll give you. Fine. Now will you come in for a cup of tea? Yes. Rabbi, why did you make me freeze outside and tell me your story? I would have helped you regardless. Why not come in? I wanted you to feel what the widows are feeling right now when they don't have firewood. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't be sensitive towards them. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't understand what they're going through. See what I mean? So we have to develop that sensitivity somehow. <laughs> How are we going to develop that sensitivity? A lot of good books, really, that share valuable advice, insight into all kinds of situations that arise in life. And if we educate ourselves by reading about them, we definitely will become better people. We're not born with these qualities. We have to develop them. So sensitivity is an important quality to develop. Last but not least, I think this is very valuable. It's something that most people, I'm talking about Jews right now, are completely oblivious to. Really, even though they may have heard about this, they're pretty much oblivious. And that is what the rabbis tell us in Pirkei Avot. Very powerful statement that if we follow it, we will not only be stronger, we will be better focused, and hopefully we will be more successful in our human relationships and with our relationship with God. And this is what the rabbis tell us. You want to succeed? You want to be on top? Da! Mashele mala mimcha? Always remind yourself who is on top. Who is above you? Ein roa ozen shomat vechol maasecha basefer nichtabim. There is a constant eye watching over you. There is an ear who hears everything you say. And all your deeds are being recorded. Remember that? Mm -hmm. yeah, of course, we learned it. We all learned it. But how many people actually think about it on a daily basis? I'm being watched right now. They're looking at me. How am I going to deal with this situation? Am I going to be cruel? Am I going to be kind? How? We're not perfect. We make mistakes. That's okay. That's what Teshuvah is all about. But this will be very helpful if we constantly remind ourselves that there's an eye out out there, up there, that is watching over us. And when a person is at his job and the boss is looking at him, you would agree that his work will be very, very different than if the boss is gone for a month. 
exam returning till a month later, isn't there going to be a difference between the two? Yeah. If the <coughs> boss is looking at me as I'm working, you better believe that I'm going to be doing my job a lot better. Not just to impress him. I want to do a good job automatically. Make believe. Well, not only make believe. Know it for a fact. Think about it. There is someone up there who's watching everything you do, and everything you say is being heard, and everything you do is being recorded. And of course, all of that we will have to face in the afterlife. I want to finish with a special prayer that we all know. That's very important to ask these days, especially that despite all the difficulties that the Jewish people, that the world is experiencing with uh, uh, divisiveness and with conflicts, we have to pray that Hashem Oz Ten, Hashem Yevarechet Amo Vashlom. We really have to pray and ask that Hashem should give us the strength, that Hashem should give us peace, should bring about peace amongst the Jewish people, and without Hashem, peace in the entire world. Amen.